I'm going to talk today about, believe it or not, error analysis, eventually. Not at first, but I'll, there's a real reason for that, and that is that when we derive shock equations, you don't need to know the mechanism or anything, as you know, the Reagan uh, Huguenot equations. But you know, if you're an experimentalist, you really probably do, otherwise you have big errors in your data. And I'm going to try to make that point uh, in the talk. So uh, let me get started. I, at first, I would really want to thank my mentors. I, like all people that uh, are in a field for a long time, you have mentors. And my mentors were first uh, Nathaniel Colburn at the White Oak Lab. He uh, got me into the shockwave group in 1964, after I was an intern at the White Oak Lab. And uh, I started doing uh, phase transition work with him at that point. We did boron nitride, we made diamonds out of boron nitride, and things like that. And then later, John Erkman from SRI joined us, and. Uh, at the White Oak Lab, and he, John and I became friends, and he became a strong mentor. He was one of the people I could go to and talk about shock physics that really knew it, so uh, uh, it really helped me a lot. And of course, George Duvall, who met me at a Gordon conference and knew I was getting, a, uh, had gotten a master's degree at Maryland and was going on for a PhD, and he suggested I go to Pullman. And, I did, so it turned out to be a great experience. And uh, I stayed with the Navy lab from up to 1996. That's a, you can see a picture of the lab. Does this work? Yeah. Of course, this is now Nathaniel Coburn, John Erkman, and George Duvall. <clears throat> I obtained my PhD in 1976 because I was doing it at night and working during the day. So I uh, became very active in the shock community after Bob Graham asked me to organize shockwave sessions on the East Coast in the late 1970s. And then, of course, I got involved in, set, in uh, setting up the uh, APS shock group here. And from 1996 to 2003, I worked at Livermore with Craig Tarver uh, to do shock initiation studies on energetic materials and to run the big uh, powder gun in the facility uh, at Heath, which is their in-lab in uh, uh, shock for the explosive. Oh, there it is. Since then, I've, I've uh, consulted for Energetic Technology Center, which is a small company that allows me to do what I want, so that's why I work for them. So, uh, uh, and, and I do teach graduate level, uh, master's level shockwave course based on the book that, that uh, was shown. And uh, I actually have to say, I uh, have a privilege of knowing many of the people in the audience, but I'm very, very pleased to see so many young people uh, that are in the field. I think that speaks highly of the field and how it's growing. Uh, some of the, the th at least I know th three people here that was original signees and, and started the group, and that's Bill Nellis and, and Jim Assay, and, and I was also part of that group. There may be some others, but I didn't spot them yet. So, so we're still uh, coming to the meetings and, and, and participating and enjoying it. <clears throat> that's all about me, and, and by the way, it is me. Those that know me uh, never see me in a suit, so just, <laughs> I, I own two of them, actually. So. But uh, today I felt I should do that. The talk here is going to uh, be a specific thing. It, as he said, I, I'm now a professor, so I learned that a lot of things the students don't know, and error analysis is one, and so you'll see it by the end of the talk that maybe uh, I might impress you that we need to do a little more on air analysis in the field. Uh, we're, you know, in our field, we're limited with the number of experiments we can do because they're very expensive. So from an air viewpoint, you need to repeat experiments to get really accurate data. Uh, of course, we can't do that because it's too expensive. So we have to use another approach. And uh, 
we also have to use approximation in interpreting the data, and a lot of times that's not even put in the paper, what, what are the approximations. And by the way, the jump equations are approximate. So uh, if you read papers by Duvall and others, there's a one-line sentence saying these are approximate, but he never tells you why. So I'm going to try to tell you why. So uh, They're not very approximate because they obviously new fields of sprung up using the jump relations and uh, uh, so it's very exciting they must be really powerful but we don't know how accurate they are unless you really look into it I just wanted to show you the flow in 1d flow that you derive the, uh, and I'm not going to do the derivation so uh, but you derive the a little uh, draw your diagram with this actually usually with two windows you can actually derive the, the differential equations and uh, which I'm only going to show you what they are. And this, so you conserve mass, momentum, and energy. And the physicists uh, that aren't shock physicists know these terms very well. Turns out this is what it is in hydrodynamic shock physics. Uh, and, and of course, the, the uh, U is the flow velocity, rho is the density, P is the press or pressure or stress, and E is the internal energy of the system that. Uh, uh, once you shock it, it will gain internal energy. <clears throat> well, those are the fundamental equations, but if you have a steady shock wave, all the uh, terms that with respect to time go to zero, and you get the jump equations, which are the ones that most of us use, especially as experimentalists. And this is a two-wave one, but it's essentially, if, you, if the first wave is, is zero, we, you get the, nor the ones normal, but this is the more general one for the second wave from the pressure from the P1, E1, Rho1, U1, a step jump goes to uh, P2, E2, Rho2, U2, and the, this is how those equations uh, come out. And they're very simple. You notice you only have to measure two things here, and you have, the, you have everything known in the set of equations. This is your thermodynamic connection, to, uh, which we call uh, Usually it's a hegonial point, but there's exceptions, and that's one thing I'll point out to you later. Uh, not everything that we measure with steady waves are actually hegonial points. And, uh, but I'll get to that, that's part of my other talk. These equations are quite, quite good and, and easy to use, and the only thing you have to do is make sure you have a steady wave. Now, the strength of this is there's no physical mechanism required to, to really derive these equations and uh, and so they're very powerful and, and, and very useful. The experimentalist only has, as I said, I measure two of the parameters. It's usually shock velocity and particle velocity or free surface velocity or some other parameter. And if you have a pressure gauge these days, then it could be pressure. So one of the two Shock velocity is always the easiest, so you always measure that. Then you choose the second parameter. And uh, it turns out that to, to use these equations, they, the wave has to be steady, or it can be, it, it can be treated as a discontinuity. And this is a, a paper by Swan, Duvall, and Thornhill that's actually very good on telling you that if it's not this, it's, it's not a hugonium, it's off the hugonium. It's one of the early papers on that in 1973. And, and we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. So the question is, how accurate is the data? Everyone will do uh, error analysis and claim uh, and put error bars on it. And so there's three, at least three issues that I want to point out. The first issue is that the experimentalist needs to make sure it is steady. It can't just be quasi-steady. If it is, then you have to do some uh, analysis of, okay, how much air is it since it's not a steady uh, wave propagating through the sample. And the second issue is, do steady waves with long rise times result in true Huguenot points? And that's a question that has been talked about in, in the literature. Uh, Wallace wrote papers on it in 1980. There's a recent paper by, from a German, uh, Peter Krull, uh, which is quite his, a histor history of shockwave physics. If you haven't read that paper, it's very interesting. And he also points out that maybe you're measuring 80 bats if, if the rise time is long. 
And I'll show you why that once I get a little further into the, the talk. And uh, so that is an issue that we have to think about, is that it's true what we measure and the equations work, but is it a Hugonian? That's, that's the question here. And if it's a jump, it, it, uh, uh, discontinuity it certainly is. Uh, if it has long rise time, it might not be. So the third issue is how good does the material model have to be for interpreting the experimental data accurately? Well, clearly I'm an experimentalist, so this, this speaks volumes to me. And so after my almost 50 years, I think I might understand how to do air analysis. So I thought I'd, if, if that's true, I'm going to maybe pass a few gems on to you. I'm going to really concentrate on this third issue here at the rest of the talk. And again, it's going to be one-dimensional uniaxial shock loading, you know, gas guns, mainly, or flyer plates. Uh, and I'm going to talk about 6061T6. Besides iron, 6160T6 aluminum seems to be studied more than any other materials I can think of. Iron first. So. But because uh, that started the field back in Los Alamos, as you, as you, if you know the history, and if you don't, go back to the Atlanta proceedings and read my paper on the history of this group. So, well, let's briefly talk about elastic plastic materials. And the observation, and others have also did it, but in 1967, Erkman and Christensen published a paper showing that the attenuation of a uh, Elastic plastic shock, this is the elastic plastic solid. The, the attenuation or the elastic release is much faster than the hydrodynamic uh, model, which you would do by a code. And so that you can't use the fluid model. The field started out with just the fluid model, to be honest, in the 1950s. And uh, now that you do talk, we're talking solids in certain pressure ranges, that fluid model is not very good. And so you have to know what range you can use it. And uh, Erkman showed that this attenuation was occurring, so that meant that we needed a model in shockwave physics to treat elastic plastic materials, because we were treating them as fluids. And, uh, you know, fluid would just go straight up to the pressure. Of course, I, I'm, this is too ideal, this step, but still would go up and then decay whereas the elastic plastic is two waves. So that, that is quite a different uh, model. The brief history of, of the, uh, the high stress level, a lot of the work in the, like the Los Alamos compendium was very high pressure. And uh, it turns out the fluid model's not too bad there. In fact, real high pressure is not bad at all. But uh, as far as getting uh, the this relationship that the free surface velocity of a material is twice the particle velocity of the shock going towards that boundary. So, but if you're, if you're less than pressures 10 times the uh, HEL, and I think it's 6.4 for aluminum, so if you're below 64 kilobars, you cannot use the fluid model to analyze your data. Uh, it will be off, and I'm gonna show you that, because I have both, uh, symmetric impact data and calculations to, to really demonstrate that. Uh, the stress levels, uh, well, this is what I just said, is, is approximately, I find, this is my rule of thumb, 10 times above the HEL, okay, you're we're gonna get within one or 2% uh, by using, uh, if you're measuring free surface velocity, and by the way, in the original work, a lot of free surface velocity was measured to give you the particle velocity for the shock. Nowadays with Visor, with a window, there's other techniques, but a lot of the data in the continuum, the compendium in Los Alamos was basically uh, based on this approximation here. And it is an approximation, I guess that's the point. But in some cases it's, you know, less than a percent, less than a half a percent. Other cases it's five, six percent. So just to remind you, if you haven't taken my class, and by the way, it's an online class, anyone can take it. Uh, so, at the University of Maryland, I actually have students uh, in, in Europe and other places, so 
This is just the XT or impedance matching. The first thing you learn when you go to Pullman WSU is to learn how to do impedance matching. So I still teach that. That's the first three chapters of my book, actually. Uh, this would be a fluid model where you have a free surface, you have a shock wave reaching it, and then you have a relief fan uh, re releasing the pressure to maintain the momentum and, and conserve energy. And in that case, if you do the impedance matching, the PU plane, the forward-facing PU curve, or which means the shock going left to right, will have to fall on this curve, and, the, and all that is is conserving momentum and pressure, you know, the conservation of mass momentum. That's what the, that graph does. It, so if you're on this uh, curve for a single shock, then you're conserving the mass momentum and energy. And that's for this forward-facing shock. Now on the relief wave, that's a backward-facing wave, or a wave going from right to left, and it'll have to fall on the reflected Hugonio. And this is symmetric, notice. Therefore, this point is one half of this point. Well, this point is the free surface velocity, and that's why you measured it. And the free surface velocities were easier to measure than in internal uh, particle velocity, certainly in the 50s and 60s. And so you, a lot of people, including myself, use free surface velocities. And so if it's a fluid, uh, it's, this relationship really does work. But elastic plastic material is not a fluid, so it doesn't work for pressure rings. Here is the impedance matching for elastic plastic model so it shows, this is an XT diagram, and, and in Pullman, T is always in the y-axis, so I know a lot of people will ask me why, because huh? George Vol did it that way, that's why. <laughs> so, uh, so it's XT, this shows the elastic wave ahead of the plastic wave. The elastic wave gets to the free surface first, is reflected and reduces the pressure in the plastic wave and therefore elastic wave is reformed and goes to the surface again and back and that continues to happen. So the plastic wave actually never reaches the free surface velocity, uh, free surface. It's all done by the elastic wave. And this would be the PU diagram. And the PU diagram, of course, goes up the elastic wave to the plastic wave and then it's relieved and it's actually, uh, uh, four thirds the yield stress is if you use plastic plastic theory, which I'm going to review. And then it comes to a point eight, and then it goes down, it's elastically relieved, and then it goes down plastically until it's only the elastic wave again that's, that exists, and therefore final free surface velocity is, is here. Now that's sort of complicated, and if you do it correctly, and this is without hydrocode, hydrocodes obviously handle this, so. But if you're trying to do it as an experimentalist and, and trying to do it with just PU diagrams, this becomes very complicated. And so you probably won't do it that way. So John Erkman suggested that uh, we could do, solve this with the Riemann integral. And it was his suggestion and him and I worked on it for a while. We never finished it before they closed the lab down. And, but I finished it now. So. Uh, the Riemann integral says the change in the particle velocity is the integral of the d sigma is the stress because it's a solid over rho c, and you can play around with it and get it. So if you can do this integral, then you can solve what the particle velocity is at the uh, free surface. So what I'm going to do is use the elastic plastic model of Duvall and Erkman's, which is the simplest one, we won't let the yield, we'll do, the yield will be considered uh, constant, where it doesn't have to, but that is what we're going to do. So we use Hooke's Law uh, for the metals, which is good for metals, but not necessarily for everything, anything else, but it is Hooke's Law, if you do, this is just to show you I know what a tensor is, so, but because it's 1D, it really is this, so uh, this is if you look up in the uh, solids uh, plasticity books, this is what you see, and, and it's quite uh, good, but, but for, for us, we only have strain in one direction, so these are zero, and therefore you get the simple equations for the elastic plastic 1D model that Erkman and Duvall published. And 
you know, sigma one one is, is, is sigma x, you know, and uh, I think that's probably, every, all the people here know the, uh, what I'm talking about here. And this is the strain, uh, epsilon one one and epsilon two two. Epsilon one one is a, a strain in the x direction. So, well, this is the model. And, and of course, there's a lot more to it, but uh, I'm not gonna spend time on it. But the model is for elastic plastic material, and this is versus V of naught over V minus one. And uh, Duvall and, and Erkman use mu, but everyone will get that uh, confused with the Poisson ratio, so I use psi. So, uh, so essentially, when you shock a elastic plastic material, it goes up to the AGL, and then it plastically deforms and goes to the final state. Then, in this model, it goes four thirds Y down, elastically released, and then it plastically releases back. And at D is zero pressure, and that's the free surface velocity. So if you can take and start from this point, because that the jump equations get you to that point, you don't have to use the equation, you can start here, do this integral and this integral, Riemann integral, till you get to this point, you have calculated the free surface velocity, which is shown here, and this just shows you that you can put it in terms of uh, the uh, sigma d psi, and what I, to get this d sigma d psi, I took the uh, Los Alamos work on 61 t6, I uh, went ahead and uh, corrected it for not, uh, them not using elastic wave in their analysis so that I got the mean pressure and I fit it with a th uh, third order polynomials all. So it's just uh, gives me the data on aluminum and I'm not going to show you that but it's, that's what I actually did. And then I took that data and subtracted two thirds y because that's, this model says that's what the mean stress is. and so. That allowed me to then have what I needed to do this integral is, is the uh, mean stress. I'm gonna do this calculation. I'm not gonna show you, I'm just gonna show you the results. I don't wanna bore you. So, uh, uh, and I wanna compare them to experimental data because uh, you know, I could show you the calculation and without doing, showing you how it really, what the values really are, I haven't done much. Well, I did look for the liter through the literature and there are a number of uh, studies where they both measured free surface velocity and particle velocity. And particle velocity in these cases are symmetric impact, that means a aluminum flyer hitting a aluminum material and as long as the transition to elastic plastic is fast, and we assume it is in the picosecond area, uh, then uh, you have this symmetry for the flyer, aluminum flyer hitting it reaching this point. And therefore, if you measure this flyer velocity here, you actually then know the particle velocity due to this symmetry. If you're doing symmetric impact, that's a, one type of an experiment. So actually, this measuring this, the, actually the gun velocity or the projectile velocity, if you're doing symmetric impact, gives you exactly what the particle velocity is. And so, in doing that, what I've done here is some comparisons, and let me explain what is in this table. First of all, here is the particle velocity measured. This is the free surface velocity measured from the uh, data I found. And uh, like Jim Assay has some points in his paper where they did both. That's what I was looking for, both symmetric impact and free surface velocity measurements so that I could uh, do this comparison. And other people, uh, Lundgren and Herman and Johnson and Barker. And some of this data is quite old, and which I'll make a comment on, 1963. This was pen data, so, uh, and then this, uh, some of it's Visor data. So, I didn't, because of the techniques, I thought I could talk about the errors in that uh, uh, with this. But the point I really wanna make is that if you take and subtract two times UP from measure to the, uh, a measured free surface velocity, you'll find that down in the area, you know, this, remember the Hugonian elastic limit is about 6.4 or 0.064. And so these, these are uh, all above that. And notice that the errors, and, and just let's look at this column where I'm actually comparing, taking 
the free, measured free surface velocity minus twice the uh, particle velocity and comparing them. And notice that uh, that's quite a large error, 18, 15%, 4%, uh, even 6.4%. But up to about 203 kilobars, it's down to less than 1%. So in this region, you cannot use the fluid model, this is the point. You have to use the elastic plastic model to, to actually get your data. And the other uh, column here is uh, just showing you that if you take the calculated, this is my calculation versus the measure to see how good uh, this, this also does in this range. And you can see that the pen data, there, there may be some problems with it because its, it's error is not too good. The Visar data, this, this point was an old, uh, one of the earlier Visar measurements was 1.8%, uh, but up here in, in uh, 50 kilobars, it's less than a percent error between the calculated and, and the measure. And so that's not so bad, and I suspect that, well, it only go, is going to get better. At higher pressures, it's going to be less than a percent. And the other one was just showing myself that uh, this was true, that, that it, as I went up in pressure, the, the air is going to be a percent or less. But down in this region where the two waves exist, you cannot use a symmetric uh, uh, argument like a fluid. And I, I'm assuming most of you know that, but just in case you don't, uh, you have to treat it, and it doesn't, it's not easy. So the experimental data, the summary is, is and calculations both show that the stress is less than about 10 times the HEL, uh, that UFS is not equal to U, 2UP, which you already should know. But, but I'm, I'm trying to show you that, that the point here is if you're going to do accuracy things, you can't just say it, you've got to show it in, in, with numbers, and that's what I'm trying to do here. And note that it's well known that the release profile is affected by the Boschinger effect, I didn't treat any of that. That can be treated, but it usually takes a code. And remember, I'm doing this with a calculator and, and a Mac, and I don't have a code. So, and of course, I was still at Livermore, I'd just have Craig Harvard do it, but uh, I'm not. So, okay, so let's focus on the error analysis for shock experiments. Typically, have a small number of points. I made that. I want to read to say that. So what is typically done, and I think this is important too, since we don't have a large data set, it's important to know how people do error analysis because then you can check it, even if it isn't a large data set. So what I believe most of my colleagues do, and what I certainly recommend is uh, follow the theory of errors, even though it's, it, and to determine your random and systematic errors, this is not statistically justified if you read these uh, books on theory of error like Yardley Beers and, and Taylor. But if you're, that you're following the same procedure that people with larger sets are, and so people in the field know how you did your error analysis. And that way, if they have questions about it, they can go back and look at your data and see if they agree with you. And I think that's very important to a field like this, where we can only do a small set of uh, experiments because the funders aren't giving us enough money to do large sets, and, and they will not. So, uh, uh, so I think this is important for the, this type of approach to be used commonly. And uh, so, I can't resist, and I'm sorry, this is where the professor hat goes on. I'm going to teach you air analysis in case you don't know it. I also put a whole chapter, uh, section in my book because all my students, I find, don't know how to do error analysis. And I won't talk about my colleagues, but I have my opinion. So, uh, the precision is what people normally do. You can, you can do precision, uh, which is part of the error, and that's, you know, how good your, uh, how many calculations you do and how accurate you're measuring it. And when you measure it, what is the statistics? So that's your precision. And that's what everyone really seems to know how to do. And, and that's fine. And accuracy, though, is when experimental uh, data has systematic, which means non-independent errors. And the systematic errors mainly come from instrumentation calibration, 
But it also can be from material model errors, and, which I think I've demonstrated, or I hope I have. And so if, you're, if you don't have the correct material model, if, for example, in plastic, plastic uh, materials and you measure the free surface velocity, uh, if you want to interpret that to get, and you don't have the symmetric impact, and you want to calculate the accurate particle velocity, you better have a good elastic plastic model. And then you will probably do, well, you will do a good job then. So that, that's the real point, is that systematic errors are not easy to do. Random errors actually is not, not hard. Uh, systematic errors are a little tougher to do. And from the theory of errors, just to remind you, well, first of all, as you know, that when you have more than one measurement, the accuracy of the random errors go down because of the square root of the number of the measurements. So if you have the same measurement, the same eugonial point, uh, the error is less than any one error of the measurement because you get to divide by the square root of the number of measurements. And so that's why you would like to do more measurements if you are claiming you have extremely accurate data. But to actually claim accuracy, you have to do the systematic errors. And that's combined with the square root of both errors, the random errors and the systematic errors, and that'll be, that's your actual error. And I suspect a lot of people know how to do this and they ignore this, so. So, this is, I'm repeating myself, but I think that sometimes it's very good to do that. Random errors are easiest to estimate and commonly used in experimental error. But to keep the systematic errors of shockwave data small and accounted for requires an accurate material model, which I believe I've showed at least on the elastic plastic material. Time really doesn't allow me to do other materials. I was thinking of doing that, and then I realized that I only had 40 minutes, so, uh, and I tend to talk a little once I get started, so I decided I couldn't do it. But there are two areas I wanted to make another point on, which is sort of now, sort of near the end of the talk. And I do, my first part of my career was in phase transitions and, and Hugonios. Then I went to Livermore to do detonation physics. Uh, even though I was in the explosives area in the Navy lab, I really wasn't doing explosive work at that time. But when I went to Livermore and worked with Craig, uh, we started doing a lot of detonation physics. And so, that was a, a very nice uh, thing to, to learn. And it, but there's been experimental evidence over 50 years that there's radiation and electron ejection occurring on detonation wave fronts. Otherwise, if you put a, a, a screen out at the end of a charge, electrons are, you collect electrons way before the detonation wave reaches the end. So you're ejecting electrons and uh, also, more recently, uh, the Portugal group has been showing that internal, uh, the radiation gets hot spots. And uh, so this leads you to believe that maybe if we're going to start looking at, uh, to do more ignition and growth models, we have to start thinking about some of the uh, conditions and assumptions of the uh, jump equations and whether the radiation uh, exists or not. Because that's, remember, the jump equations assumes that only uh, PDV work is all that is done here. So if you have radiation from internal or external, uh, you may want to look at it because it, 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 it should be accounted for. If it's small, then that's fine, as long as you can prove that. But if, I'm not even sure if it's small, it, it still might do something on the ignition of, of these organic materials. Another point was, as we saw yesterday when Bruce gave some excellent work on the laser area, which can reach very high pressures and uh, really opens the frontier on a lot of things. And uh, this is, but there is an area here that you have, you have again, I want to point out that and if the material can reach equilibrium in picoseconds, then that's fine. That, that data is great. And, and for a lot of materials, that's true. But there are some materials that uh, take time, kinetic transitions. In that case, the laser is always going to get you into the metastable states. You're not going to be in the thermodynamic equilibrium states. So you have to be very careful when you know, you have to know your material when you're doing that. 
And one of the specific examples, of course, is an old example, the polymorphic phase transition. Some of them actually take uh, a few microseconds to occur. Well, the laser people will never see that phase transition, in my opinion, uh, because it'll, they'll go up the metal stable, and then, then it'll try to come back to the, uh, the equilibrium forces, uh, thermodynamic forces, or force it towards equilibrium. But uh, it's just too long. And this is, even with the gas gun, this is true. If you've read uh, the report by Graham and Duvall on phase transitions, there's transi uh, transitions that weren't going to completion uh, it, even in uh, gas gun experiments. So the point there is just, you know, you have to uh, prove that you're in equilibrium and that, that there's no kinetic processes. Uh, but this, it's a wonderful uh, opening and I'm seeing lots of new things in shock physics and I, I'm excited about it. Um, this is not a negative comment. I think probably everyone in the field knows that you have to do this, but, but I felt I needed to bring the, the comment out so that uh, some of the new people that in the field uh, might not have thought of this. So, uh, my final comment is back to the jump relationships. The internal, the way that Rankin Hugonio jump equations are derived, it's really assume only the PDV work. I think I've worked this one too much. Is, is, it, is all that's used. We don't assume anything about heat conduction or radiation external and internal. It's neglected. But there are situations when you have a shock, steady shock that has extremely long rise time, and some of those do exist. Are you sure that heat conduction isn't occurring in that front? Because the jump relations assume that it is not. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean your equations, the first two equations are wrong. It just means that you're not getting a Hugonio point. You're getting an adiabat. Or you might be getting an adiabat. Uh, this is where Dwayne Wallace published some papers, and, uh, and I have references on that on, uh, at the bottom here. And Creel, Creel's paper also brings that same point up. Uh, his is about a 100-page paper, so, uh, and he had me review it, so it took a long time before I got comments back to him. Um, and there is still, a, it, the wave has to be steady and you have to make sure you've proven that. Don't just assume it. And uh, it, so there's no uh, simple answer if the white rate of rise time is long. You have to really get in and do some calculations to see if it is an adiabat or is it a hugonio. And this is what Dwayne Wallace did. And, uh, and it's, that's quite a lengthy calculation. It's not, and, and I'm sorry to say that because the, the beauty of the jump relations is they're so simple. But if you really want to prove the accuracy, you have to, have to do something about making sure that the assumptions for those jump relations are met. And that, the assumption is that PDV work is all that is in the Higonio energy. And if you look at Duvall's papers, which of course is the one, that's the one I would always look at, he has a one line under these, the jump equations. There's one line under, like his uh, uh, Fermi energy paper in that uh, book. Uh, it's, these are only approximate, but he never says why. <laughs> so I hope that I sort of shed a little more light on why they're only approximate. There are times when it's exact if you have the conditions right, but there are times when it's not. And so you should be aware of that and, and just look into it. So. With that, uh, that ends my talk. I appreciate your attention, and hopefully I might have reminded you of something uh, about uh, doing shockwave experiments and having high accuracy. And I